All right, so uh, next uh, we have Dr. Moline, who's going to be speaking. Uh, she's an occupational medicine specialist. Um, she spent 19 years uh, training and then working at uh, Sinai, and, uh, but now she's chair of the Population Health Department at North Shore. Um, she studied many different environmental exposures, uh, lead, um, other asbestos fibers, and as I learned last night, she actually studied theatrical smoke as an exposure and spent a lot of time at Broadway shows for that. Um, <laughs> So she's uh, had extensive involvement in studying the risks uh, related to 9-11, and she's been doing a lot of medical monitoring and treatment for uh, World Trade Center uh, uh, rescue people, and so uh, she's here today to speak about that. Thank you, and I'm um, really thrilled to be here. Um, I'm going to switch gears and talk about in occupational medicine. After I, I was when I did the theater study, which was looking at the health effects of theatrical smoke and fog on actors on Broadway. My parents could actually describe one of the things I did, and people would understand because most people knew shows and there were special effects on Broadway. Um, but um, when we think about occupational medicine. I like to describe it. It took me like 20 years to come up with a tagline, but it's we look for the whys, not just the what's. So we can treat the what's, but we look for the whys. So what I want to talk about is a little bit uh, is what we know about asbestos-related diseases, and then we're going to talk a little bit about something that may be an issue related to mesothelioma going forward. Now, there are numbers that have gone back and forth, and Dr. Taub earlier mentioned that there were a slightly higher number. It depends on what year you look and what numbers. But just looking at trends, 3,300, 4,300, it's thankfully a small number, any number. Occupational medicine is a preventive medicine specialty, meaning that by its very nature, to me, any mesothelioma shouldn't be there. So we should have a number of zero, and hopefully we'll get there someday. But there's thoughts that they may have peaked. The diseases may have peaked in the United States, thanks to strict regulation. Um, worldwide, we know the cases will be increasing as it's exported. Um, in poor countries, there's very poor regulation. They're used in houses. Um, and there's going to be another wave of disease throughout the world. If you look at numbers, this is a busy slide for you to be looking at, and it really doesn't matter. And these are based on SEER data, um, which is um, disease registries based in 13 states, I believe, and it's pooled. It's how we get to numbers where the rates are of cancer. But the thing to look at, it, and don't worry about when a year was added to SEER, because that's just when they started reporting in. But if you can look, the age-adjusted incidence in men is very high in Seattle. It's 2.85 per 100,000. Now, very high is relative because this is still a rare cancer. In fact, we know that a rare cancer is considered less than 0.08% of the population is at risk of getting the cancer or a cancer under 200,000 a year. So mesothelioma is, in fact, considered quite a rare cancer. Again, should not be happening, so any is too much. But if we look at the areas where in some of the SEER states we see it, there, there are higher rates related to where there may be shipyards. For example, Seattle has a high rate because of the shipyards. New Jersey, similarly, because of the industry and shipyards. Again, these are predictions of when, uh, in looking at the incidence, um, actually, these are actual numbers looking at age effects and temporal trends in the past. And you can see they've gone up. They haven't come down. There were some earlier models that said that, that the rates of disease should have come down more than they have at this point. And um, for women, it's been fairly um, stable. In New York State, um, our rates are 1.8 per 100,000 men, and it's 0.4 per 100,000 women. Now, this is a projection through 2054. Now, I, I, this is some data that was published in 2009. 
And they were looking at direct exposure to asbestos. And what they're saying is different models of who might be. But if you see, what they're saying is it's going to go down so that the number in men is going to approximate the number in women. And I don't have... Um, I don't have a legend on here, so you can tell the dots, but the open dots, um, the, the bottom is going to be the, the open dots, uh, the open blue dots are women. So they're predicting that men and women are going to converge. I think this is a bunch of hooey, because what they're doing in here is if you read the article carefully, they're talking about those who had direct usage of it, and they're not thinking about all the others who had indirect usage of it. So I, I think we have to look at many of these projection, projections with a grain of salt. I would love for there to be only 750 cases per year in another 40 years. I don't think that's going to be the case because there are other exposures that have come up. We'll be talking about them in about 10 minutes. Um, I don't think we'll get a lot from that other exposure we'll talk about in 10 minutes. But still, there are intervening events that may make it more likely for additional folks to have asbestos exposure. So let's think about where folks might get exposed to asbestos. Now, if you go to your general internist for a regular visit, they'll ask you what you do for a living. And they'll ask you what you do now. And you'll tell them. And some of you aren't working anymore. More power to you. But then you'll, they'll write down that you're retired. They've just totally, your occupational history is gone. You're done. You're retired. Didn't matter what you did for 50 years, 60 years, whatever it was. They may only look at what you're, if you are currently working, they look at what you're doing now. Has anyone ever gone to a doctor, besides if you've seen me, and because there are a few of you who have, um, where they've actually asked you every single job you ever had? One in the audience, okay, that's amazing. But he probably only had one job in his whole life. Um, but, you know, what's important is to think about all the jobs someone might have had, and that'll, that'll come to bear in one of the, the cases that I'm going to talk to you about. But if we look at the sources of asbestos that have been in industry, it's been in construction, it's been in product manufacturing, automotive repair shops, mining companies, in um, mineral stone products, rust removal businesses, oil refineries, power plants, maritime companies, shipbuilders, chemical manufacturing, railroads, railways, railways, yarn, thread, and fabric mills, trucking, plastic and rubber manufacturing, manufacturers of sand or abrasives, steel manufacturers, tile cutters. The list goes on and on. This is not exhaustive, by the way. This is just a partial list. And then if you look at the occupations, now again, this isn't all the occupations, it's just, just many of them. It goes from a pipe fitter and a plasterer and a steam fitter and a millwright and a carpenter and a boiler maker and a janitor and a roofer and a tile setter and a miner and a miller and a textile worker and an electrician and an insulation worker and you name it and there is the potential for asbestos exposure if you know to ask. And, and often it is that people don't know what people do you know, I, I'm about to undergo renovations in my apartment, and I was talking to the architect, and I'm talking about the conduits and the electrical panels. And mind you, I wouldn't want to be within, you know, anywhere, but I can talk about all these products because I've talked to people in their jobs and what they did day in and day out. And I'm like, oh, that's where the electrical conduits go in the wall. I mean, not that I would know what one looked like, mind you, but I just know that they exist because people have described to me exactly what they do. So... There are folks who have been exposed and they're not sure. There are folks that worked with it day in and day out, and there may have been folks that worked with it for brief periods of time. Now, there are other sources of asbestos exposure. You notice that the font's getting smaller, the print's getting smaller and smaller, and the other sources is getting longer. So this goes, and you know, this again, there's more than, this is not a fully exhaustive list. Um, you know, I remember talking to a carpenter once who was working in schools. And so we talked about what he did, and, and he was doing a lot of floor tile laying in, in the days where there was asbestos floor tiles in the schools, um, the VAT tiles, for those of you who may be familiar with that. But then there was another thing. He was assigned, his job was to put the doors on. And 
you know, when doors come, you know, silly me think doors come with locks on them, but you have to drill the actual lock into a door. Now, if it's an asbestos fire door, you're drilling into a asbestos laden door. So that's an exposure that someone wouldn't think of necessarily unless you knew that a fire door actually meant that there was asbestos in the core and that was a repeated exposure that someone might have had. So it's in caulk and fire blankets in the theaters. We can go back to that other study, you know, the, the nice fire curtains on the front curtains. They all used to be asbestos curtains because they were fire suppressing curtains. Um, hair dryers had asbestos in them, toasters, wallboard, um, cement siding, cooling towers, chalkboards, um, electrical cloth, decorative plaster. When they were, there was someone um, who had, um, they were making the, the ceiling and making the stucco on the ceiling and they used to spray asbestos up to make the popcorn ceiling. And when they would sit and watch TV, part of the ceiling would fall down on them and so they'd be brushing off part of the ceiling and they didn't realize that that was actually asbestos that was used because it was used in not only decorative but also in acoustical ceilings. Now there are sources from the environment. We know that mining, milling, and weathering of the rock can lead to outdoor air and um, exposure and dust. There's release of fibers from disturbed building uh, materials, whether it's vermiculite insulation, asbestos insulation, or in laborers or others or abatement workers who are working with asbestos products or removing what's in place. In the manufacture, wear and disposal of asbestos containing products, those pumps and those valves that have gaskets where folks have to scrape them out. They use a wire brush, they use a grinding wheel. Those are all ways of removing the old gaskets that are asbestos gaskets that get the asbestos into the air Released from brake linings or crushed asbestos rock used in road construction, used to be used in runways as a um, anti-friction so that there wouldn't be, when planes would land with all the friction, it, um, it also added some strength to the runways. And then it can get into drinking water with the erosion of um, natural land sources um, it, and it can get in through rainwater. Here's just a few pictures. I think it's um, illustrative. These are just pictures because it shows the fibers in the lung. Um, and you can see an, a coated fiber. It's iron coated amongst the other cells. You can see the long straight fiber amidst the other cells in the background. So there's an article that recently came out from Australia. And, and I'm going to go through it a little bit only because I like the way they break down the categories. So they broke it down into direct use indirect use for insulation and auxiliary tools, the construction sector, and then this is the category that I find most um, interesting isn't the right word, but telling in many ways, because the first three people are more aware of than people have heard about, but it's the accidental and unaware exposures, which is, I think, where people are maybe developing mesothelioma that they're that they don't know about and someone hasn't probed them to find the source. So the direct use, shipbuilding and repair, cement, railroad carriages, the mining, the port handling, um, asbestos tile, textile, it was used in cloth, it was used in pajamas, it was used in a variety of in asbestos gloves that were used in labs, friction material, gaskets and packing, used in valves and in pumps the indirect use in many refineries and other plants where it was part of the process, whether it was in some of the machinery was insulated and folks who were working there had bystander exposure. If they were folks worked in the aluminum industry, all the pots, which people, what's your job? I work in the pot room. In certain sectors, people would wonder what that meant. If you said, I work in the pot room, but yeah, exactly. And it wasn't a, the anti-nausea treatment. It was, but these were the folks that were the, the pots where the um, ore was being melted were all lined with asbestos because the, the temperatures were so high. Also in the steel industry, similarly. Um, paper industry, jewelry, um, wood processing. 
they consider construction as the entire industry. They don't even break it down. They don't even try to, because they say it's a whole industry where there was spray-on asbestos. Ceilings, floor tiles, wallboard, plaster, cement, joint compound, electrical work, fire doors, boilers, steam pipes, HVAC systems, sheet metal work, caulk, elevator work. And then the accidental and unaware exposure, whether it's car mechanics or brake mechanics, jute sack recycling. So asbestos was carried in jute sacks. They were recycled, but the asbestos fibers never get out of that jute sack because they get interwoven. So as they're being reused, people continue to have exposure. Dentists, service industry employees where asbestos was in place, talcum powder use, laboratory workers, researchers. Here's another, actually uh, a, a large cell with an asbestos fiber within it. So let me just talk to you, anyone recognize the TV show here? So this was a, a one case, he was an advertising executive who had worked in advertising his entire career. In excellent health, was an office worker, and he had no home renovations. So our madman there, um, when you did a full occupational history, found that he had college employment of note, and he was a parts picker. And he was a parts picker in a automobile plant with his father and brother, and his parts that he was picking or carrying or distributing were friction materials that contained asbestos. Another case was a dentist. He worked as a dentist his whole career, and he had no other employment. Now, how is a dentist going to be exposed to asbestos? Well, <clears throat> dental crowns, when they were in dental school, they had to master the art of making a dental crown. And the way you make a dental crown is using the lost wax technique. Jewelers also use the lost wax technique, and this is basically where they make the mold, and then they pour in the wax, heat it up, and, but they line the, uh, the mold with asbestos tape that they have to cut. In order to graduate from dental schools, you have to make a certain number of um, crowns that are adequate. Some people are better at it than others, so if you're really bad at it, you're using a lot more tape. So there are a number of folks that I've actually evaluated, a number of dentists, about seven of them, who have developed mesothelioma, and the thing they have in common is the lost wax technique using the dental tape. Um, and again, similar in the jewelry industry where they were using similar techniques. And the reason it's called lost wax is because when it's heated, they pour the wax out and are left with the thing so the, the, law, the wax gets lost or melted away. Third case was a, a physician who was in excellent health. He was exercising and he noted he was becoming short of breath and he was diagnosed with mesothelioma. Now, like many of the folks who have been speaking here, he was not only a uh, clinician, but he was also a researcher. And he worked in a lab for many years and he was exposed from asbestos gloves, mesh, pads, and insulation used around the crucibles that he used to heat up. So this was a case where you say, how would a doctor or a dentist, and I've used some professional um, folks here just because I want to, you have to really figure out what people are doing. It's not just good enough to find out what's your job title, but you actually have to figure out what your tasks are and what have you been doing throughout your career. And again, here's another picture of uh, the, the X um, with uh, the ferruginous bodies and the macrophages, which are the, some of the um, immune cells that are trying to um, to fight off the invading asbestos fibers. So people can get exposed directly through work. They work in the same space as others working with the asbestos, so you don't have to handle it yourself, but if it's in the environment where you're working, it can be on their skin, hair, and clothing, in areas surrounding a mining operation, in the community in, in Canada, there have been a number of pleural mesotheliomas in the areas where asbestos has been mined in Canada in other areas in gardening that there's disturbance of natural um, asbestos rock, and in homes and buildings where renovations or demolitions disturb asbestos-containing building materials. Now there's a study that's come out in the past year or so from Australia, and Australia mined a particular type of asbestos called chrysotylite, and it's actually been banned for its use. And what they're saying is the rates have been steadily rising over the past two decades. They're mostly in men, 
but the type of exposure is much higher as a proportion of women after home maintenance and renovation. And what they found is the percentage of folks whose exposure to asbestos has solely been through home renovation and maintenance has gone from 3 to 8% over the, from 1990 to 2005, 2008, and in women from 5 to 35%. In fact, they feel that it is the most, in Australia, the most important non-occupational exposure. It may be from performing the home renovations, from being present while they took place, and in most instances, it was not a long-term exposure. It may have only lasted for a few days, but the fibers persisted. The non-occupational environmental exposures, these are what we call the bystander exposures. These are folks whose fathers, grandfathers, husbands, brothers, usually it's, in these days it was men bringing the clothes back home. Um, would bring it home, and the, um, as the clothes were being laundered, then um, this isn't something that I have a lot of experience with, but people shake out their clothes before they, I'm just not a laundry person, um, and that's why, I mean, I don't have experience with it. They shake out their clothes before they put them in the washing machine. I mean, it's a standard, people do this. Um, and what they're shaking out is the dust. And where are if you, where are most laundry rooms located? In a poorly ventilated basement or in a small laundry room that doesn't have a lot of ventilation? So that uh, puts a, a fair amount of asbestos fibers in the air and then when you sweep it up you have additional asbestos exposure. But there were lung changes and, and one of the non-malignant changes you can see is something called pleural plaques and that was seen in about a third of folks. And almost 20% of folks actually had scarring in the lung itself, which usually you see with higher exposure than, um, but that was sufficient exposure to cause both lung and pleural scarring. So they've seen, um, also they've seen higher rates of pleural abnormalities where asbestos occurs naturally, up to two to 17% of individuals. So I wanna shift gears here and talk about something that's theoretical right now. And um, it's a fallout from the World Trade Center disaster. And, and I'm gonna show you some pictures of, and um, I do that just, I, I want you to, to look at the pictures just to think about it in terms of exposure only. So the towers were standing, smoke, fumes, fires. As the towers began collapsing, they, um, the plume, the dust, the smoke started spreading, and it could be seen as the, the plume moved um, towards Brooklyn that day. Um, Statue of Liberty is in the foreground. You can see the cloud as the buildings are collapsing, it's expanding, and you can see the dust cloud as it's in active motion right now, covering everything in its path. Here's part of the debris pile. And um, you can see in the foreground right here is a very large piece of um, machinery just to give you an idea of how big this hunkering debris pile actually was. And, and you can see the picture there of about seven stories of the frame still were standing after the buildings collapsed. This is actually taken on September 11th in the afternoon. It looks like it's nighttime, but this is a daytime picture. That's how thick the smoke was, which has led to many of the health effects that we're seeing now. And here were, this is predominantly firefighters working, and you, if there's one person, there's three people who are facing us and none of them are wearing. One is protecting his neck. We had the best protected necks because everyone wore a mask around their neck or a respirator around their neck. Um, but you can see they're walking around with debris strewn everywhere. Now when the buildings went up, this is what was on up to the 38th floor of the North Tower, but they were also used in the elevator shafts of both towers. So it was in both Tower 1 and Tower 2. The spray on asbestos was halted because of the environmental contamination in the course of um, the building. So it didn't go in, but in the Tower 2, it wasn't spray on asbestos wasn't used. Um, and, um, 
but this is similar to any building. I don't know if this is the World Trade Center or another building with typical spray on asbestos insulation that's used on the steel to make sure that the, the steel requires fireproofing because by itself it will burn. Now, this gentleman looks like he's about to get decapitated. He did not. But this is, you know, it's just the way the pictures say. But look in the foreground, and what do you see? You see a beam with insulation on it. We, we don't know if this is, insula is asbestos insulation because we don't know what floor it came from. But this is what we're concerned about. And folks are walking around, and there are, they are working to try to save people. They are not thinking about what might be in this dust, what might be in the fumes, and what the health problems might befall them later. The street level condition, so it wasn't just the folks who were working on the pile. After the collapse, you can see the street level, and this is again daytime after the collapse, the folks walking forward covered in dust. Looks like a snowstorm, but it's not. This is the, and the aftermath. And then many of the homes in the area were contaminated with dust. So when we look at what was the particle composition of the World Trade Center dust, and this was dust that was picked up by Dr. Paul Leoy from UMDNJ on September 12th or 13th, they found that the particles were, um, were very alkaline. It was like lye. And that's what makes us think about why folks are having so many problems with their breathing, their upper airway, their lower airway, their gastroesophageal reflux disease, which are all the World Trade Center covered conditions right now. Um, and it's less, led to tremendous um, psychological sequelae as well with PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety. But we know that people were breathing through their mouths, they were breathing heavily, um, and there were high concentrations. We also know that one to 4% by weight of the dust in all the dust samples was asbestos. So when we look, we know that there was gypsum calcite and silica, diesel, carbon monoxide, glass cellulose, and the crystalline, I think it's supposed to be chrysotile, I thought I fixed this, asbestos fibers were found, actually some amosite was found as well. There were also some metals, there were organics, benzene, and other um, compounds that are known to cause cancers. So if we look at what our concerns are going forward, we know that there's airway and pulmonary irritation, and there's asbestos is there as a fire retardant. And not just asbestos, but the question is, what about the fact that this was a very complex mixture? We already know one very deadly complex mixture with asbestos, which is in the lung cancer, where if you are a smoker, which is a complex mixture, and you had asbestos exposure, you're 50 to 80 times more likely to develop lung cancer. So the question is gonna be, what does this combination of the asbestos exposure combined with these 150 plus compounds that were in the dust, fume, and smoke from the World Trade Center, what is that going to lead to? They did a study, they found someone got really sick right afterwards, a firefighter. This isn't really important, and here's a CT scan that shows his lungs look like they shouldn't. But what did they find when they looked at the fluid in his lung? They found that there was chrysotile and amosite fibers in his lung. So it's clear that there was asbestos that he was breathing in. Last year, um, the firefighters were able to publish a study in The Lancet, which is a, a prestigious medical journal that showed that there was an increased rate of cancer in um, firefighters compared to pre-9-11 data. And um, as a result, in two weeks, on October 12, 2012, cancer is now going to be covered as a World Trade Center covered condition. So there will be latency periods applied to various different types of cancers, um, but folks who've developed cancers or will develop cancer, while the Zadroga bill is in effect through 2016, will be able to get their cancer covered by the Zadroga bill, which is the bill covering asbestos, uh, the bill covering World Trade Center 
health problems. So that's a new development, um, something we've been fighting for um, for many years, and it's an unfortunate development. And it shows us the sequelae of asbestos use in something where we thought that the buildings had been abated or it was in place and it wouldn't cause a problem. It can get dislodged. It can become airborne. It can get in people's homes. It can get in people's lungs when they are working, when they're doing, when they're going out and rescuing and recovering and doing what they think is right. And so I'm glad to know that we actually are covering this, but it's unfortunate that it's come to that. But um, anyway, I got the uh, you're done sign. So um, <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions really quickly if Dr. Krug allows. Um, but if not, I'll be around and happy to talk to you later. Asbestos has not been banned. In 1989, I believe, the Supreme, the uh, Circuit Court in uh, Louisiana struck down a ban. Um, so asbestos is available. It's used in some, uh, it's still allowed in gasket materials and in some other products. The use has gone down dramatically. Um, but it is, it is a, it's not, it is allowed to be sold. I think it's very, it's not very commonly available. But it is available, yeah. I don't know of any study. I think that it's, you know, if it's done right, one would hope that the asbestos abaters are protected. I, I've, I, I was, you, you didn't let me finish my sentence because I just saw a case of someone who developed mesothelioma who's an asbestos abater, who followed the rules and was a supervisor. So the best protections in the world may protect many, but they won't protect all. And this is a disease where, you know, we all know that, you know, there's OSHA standards or something called a permissible exposure limit, which has been lowered down. It's been at 0.1 fiber per cubic centimeter, which is microscopic. You can't see it. But even at that level, the government says we expect 3.4 extra cases of mesothelioma per 1,000 people at this level. So it's not a safety level. It's a regulatory level. So we know that it's an interesting concept to think about swabbing those folks to see. Part of it would be how effective is a personal protective equipment that they're using. But has anyone here worn a respirator? I know a couple people must have worn a respirator in this room here. When you wear a respirator, a cartridge respirator, what is the one thing you cannot do? You can't talk. So if you have to communicate with your colleague, even if you don't want to take that mask off, it may be a safety reason that you have to tell them something. Watch out, you're going to get hit. You're taking that mask off, and in that intervening moment, you're breathing. So it's never, it's never 100% effective. It can limit it down. I mean, it would be good to study these prospective cohorts. But again, the problem is, as we've been talking about, the numbers are so small that we would need tens of thousands of asbestos abatement workers followed prospectively for 50 years to be able to answer this question. Should we do it? Yes. Is, is it going to happen? Probably not because of cost. Sure.
Right, and I mean, there's been an ongoing bill in Congress to ban asbestos. Patty Murray from the senator has been introducing this bill every year, and it doesn't seem to get traction. And certainly, is, I don't think right now it's going to get anything that has the word regulation is going to get through. So um, it should be banned. Thank you very much. <laughs>